Since its founding in 2005, the Maine Masonic College has worked on developing qualified faculty to share their personal ex expertise and their dedication to learning. It is the college's goal to offer two classes per month free of charge with the majority of those classes open to the public. Well, unfortunately, because of COVID, we've kind of dropped it down to one class a month. But once we get up and running again with uh, COVID in the past, we're gonna do one class like this virtually, and we're gonna try to do one class in person as well, like we used to in the, uh, a few years ago. So in addition to the classes, there are two semi-annual events, the Celebration of the Arts and Sciences and the College Convocation, which happens in the fall, each which features prominent guest speakers who are leaders in their fields. The college has developed strong educational partnerships outside the craft and with the University of Maine Honors Program, as well as the University of Maine Planetarium. We take part in National History Day and provide financial support and volunteer hours to youth betterment initiatives to strengthen children's love of learning. As Masons, we know from our ritual about the importance of studying the seven liberal arts and sciences. These traditionally were grammar, rhetoric, logic, arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. But in the modern world, they have come to encompass the humanities, social sciences, and the performing and fine arts as well. It is from this broad foundation that the Masonic College creates our programs, which include topics of interest to anyone with an inquisitive mind, whether Freemasons or not. While our classes may sometimes make reference to lessons Masons have learned in the craft, it is also our goal to academically engage with the general public to create programs which enrich and stimulate. As the college motto states, we seek to bring more light to everyone we meet. I'd like to thank you all for attending this course. And I'd like to now introduce the instructors. Um, I'm George McDougall, I'm a board member, and I've been teaching critical thinking now for uh, a number of years. My partner is Don McDougall. He's also a board member. And he's been right there with me teaching this course. And we actually got our uh, college diploma through the Maine Masonic College in critical thinking. Don has another, has a couple others as well, but uh, we're both pretty proud of our critical thinking diploma. All right, now, why did I get into critical thinking? Why did I wanna teach this course? Well, I'm, I'm pretty naive in a way in that I believe people when they tell me stuff. In fact, I had an evaluation at work. Oh, it was God now. It was like 20, 25 years ago where my supervisor put that down as a negative. She said, uh, you tend to believe what people tell you. And I go, yeah, I, I guess I do. And then uh, she kind of went on to say, well, you know, people might not always tell you exactly the right stuff. So another thing happened when I became the contracts engineer for the department. Uh, my boss at the time was talking to another person and said, well, my only concern with George here as the contracts engineer is he, uh, he believes people. And my old boss who was t coming out of contracts engineer moving somewhere else said, well, don't worry, it won't be long before he doesn't do that anymore. So. And he's right, that was a, a, that position teaches you quite a bit about people. So, so critical thinking is a learned practice. You can teach yourself critical thinking. I like to think that I've come a long way in uh, studying to get my diploma and doing these courses. So it is something that you can learn, it's really great. And uh, what Don and I did is we took many classes on critical thinking we read a, a number of books on critical thinking and we went on and we got our Masonic College journey or diploma. And our mentor was uh, Sam McKeeman, who was not a Mason, but he was uh, a worker with me. And he has since passed away, but he was a quintessential critical, critical thinker. And he also taught ethics for the college for many years. So uh, 
with that, I'll jump right in here to uh, the next slide. Un unless you want to say something, Don, about why you got into it, or wait till you start talking. No, not really. But I, but all I've got is just the initial slide you put up about the Masonic College. I see no other slides yet. Correct. Okay. All right. All right. All right. So critical thinking. Here's two definitions of critical. So one of them is involving or characteristics of critics or criticism. And the second one is urgently needed, absolutely necessary. So when we're talking about critical thinking, what it, which one of these definitions are we talking about? Feel free to shout it right out. Both. Both. Anyone else think something else? I agree, both. Exactly, it's a trick question. I think critical thinking really is the uh, involving characteristics of critics or criticism, but it also is urgently needed and absolutely necessary. So very good, I can't fool you guys this morning. All right, now I'm getting old. So I'm driving into work for like the last 35 years and I decided I'm gonna take a new way to get into work. Uh, once I got to Augusta, I'm gonna go down through Civic Center Avenue or drive. And when I did, I went by an eye center and they had one of those signs out on their lawn that has you know, a, a, a phrase or something. And the phrase on this particular eye center while I was sitting at the light was, we only see what we are looking for. And I got thinking, wow, I mean, this was only like two weeks ago. And I knew I was teaching this course again. And I said, I am going to grab that. I'm going to put that as slide number one. And I tell you what, we are going to probably talk about this 20 different ways this morning. So if you don't get anything at all out of this class, write down this expression and think on it for a while. We only see what we are looking for. So Don and I, we read books with Sam and I wanted to highlight some of the books because of course, when it was in a classroom, I could leave these books out on the table and people could come up and look at them. But now we're gonna have to do it a little differently. So here's the, the really good one, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. It's about his work with Amos Tversky, who Amos is a cognitive psychologist, Kahneman, was a economic Nobel Prize winner. And this book covers a, a whole lifetime of their work together. And it's their work together was research on cognitive biases. And cognitive biases are the lenses that we look through every day to see what we see. So when we say that we only see what we are looking for, Cognitive biases is what controls what we're looking for. Might be the way you were brought up, might be the friends you hang out with, it might be a show you watched on TV last night, but it gets in there and it biases the way that you're thinking. This book talks about two types of systems of thinking. Fast thinking is that God emotion where you don't have time to think. The bear's coming at you out of the woods, you're either going to stand there and fight them or you're going to run away and you don't have time to think about it. So you make that uh, gut emotion feeling. Slow thinking is the reason thought. It's system two. And this is where you can take the time and say, well, I'm going to do this because of that. It's more of the reason critical thinking thought. And people who want to trick you will try to get you thinking in fast thinking. So like commercials and marketing, it's all about tricking you. So you react quickly and make a bad uh, choice. It's kind of where uh, intuition becomes, oh, uh, intuition's not the right word. I'll come up with it later and I'll, I'll throw it out on a different slide, but excellent book. Unfortunately, I loaned it to someone a few years ago and have not seen it back. Now, The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg is another great book. 
and habits themselves are great for getting a procedure done correctly and the same way every time. That's why when you go into the emergency room with chest pains, they're going to say, this is what we do. They have a whole thought process they're going through. It's almost like a habit. And they get into that habit and they do it correctly each time. Unfortunately, habit can also be the death of critical thinking because you're not thinking, you know? So you can have good habits or you can have bad habits. This book talks about what a, what a good habit cycle is, what bad habit cycle is, and how to get in and change that habit cycle, which is not always that easy. Now, another part of critical thinking that if we had the longer course, the three hour course in person would get into this is logic. And a good way to hone your logic skills are actually puzzles. And uh, if, like I said, in the longer version, we would actually go over these and with a number of different puzzles and you would see the logic behind each type. There's many different types of puzzles there, but they are types, so. It's a fun part. Too bad. I wish we could do it through here, but there's just not time. And the venue isn't perfect for that. So, all right, we'll get started here. We're going to go over some quotes that'll kind of get our minds prepared for what critical thinking really is. So the learned are well prepared for the world that no longer exists while the learners are preparing for the world of the future. So not exactly something you're always thinking of like that. Usually you think, well, the learned, the learned people, they're, they're well set. But for instance, when I went to school for engineering back in the eighties, we learned to survey using transits and levels. You know, we were looking through instruments that uh, the rods where we could see what the heights of different things were. But if I were to go into surveying now, that would do me not much good. I mean, I would know the principles of surveying, but the, um, the instruments have all changed. They're all computer driven. You're not really looking through a uh, telescope to try to pick out an elevation. The instrument is going to a satellite and getting information on its location or it's shooting out at a target at like 20,000 times a minute. And it's totally different. So based on what I knew in the past, it's not good for now. I really have to be a learner continuously to keep up with what's going on. And I love this because the difficulty is not so much in developing the new ideas, as in escaping from the old ideas. You know, that's the way we've always done it and it works. Why would I change? So not only are you escaping a belief system, but you're abandoning something that has been working well in the past. Now, the trick is, when do you abandon what's been working well? And that's what manufacturers really have to figure out, especially I would imagine these uh, uh, phone manufacturers, right? I mean, they're changing the phones every two months. So you have to be careful. Do they wanna ride the, ride the high they have, you know, with a phone that's working well and selling well? Do you abandon that for the next one up? Well, you have to, or else someone else is gonna come in and they're gonna give the next one up and you're not gonna be the top dog anymore. That's the trick, knowing when to switch that over, knowing when to abandon your old ideas and forming new ones. Here's another great one too. So the chains of habit are too weak to be felt until they are too strong to be broken. And that, that is where, you know, you're in the groove, you're going great, you got this habit, it's working for you. And before you know it, the groove becomes a rut and you're stuck in it. And that's what the Duhigg is talking about in his book on habits. And if you don't know what harbor you're making for, no wind is the right wind. 
that's from Seneca the Younger, quite similar to the Wizard of Oz, where he the scarecrow asked them where they're going, and they say, well, we don't know. And he says, well, then I guess you could take any road because it's going to take you there. So interesting, though, Seneca the Younger was actually just outside of Pompeii, and he's the one who gives us a lot of accounts of what was going on during the uh, eruption of the volcano. Just a little aside from what we're doing. And here's a great quote from JFK when he was addressing Yale University. Uh, the great enemy of truth is very often not the lie, but the myth. So too often we hold fast to the cliches of our forebears and we subject all facts to a prefabricated set of interpretations. So in other words, we're not even thinking for ourselves. We're going by what we're being told what's being passed down, which is very easy to do. But then he goes on to say, because we enjoy the comfort of opinion without the discomfort of thought. And the discomfort of thought is critical thinking and using your brain as a critical thinker is just like using your back to lift something up. It's hard work. So people would rather not think if someone could tell them what to do and they can just go from there. Now I'm a big reader of Agatha Christie. It's one of my favorite authors. I read her over and over again because her characters are awesome. And her detective, Hercule Poirot, is a critical thinker. And he has a he has an assistant who likes to think number one with you know fast thinking. He likes to throw out his uh gut reactions and of course Perot doesn't do that and Perot says to him my goodness Hastings it amazes me at how fast you jump to your conclusions so pointing out that it's better to reason through than just assume from the beginning all right so critical thinking <clears throat> critical thinking is a habit of mind it's the self-discipline of mind, it's a set of skills, and it's a mental process. So when I was saying how I think that I've trained myself, that's that habit of mind. I, it, you, know, you can train yourself to question certain assumptions, methods, conclusions, values, principles, rules, or even evidence, but you have to collect evidence to, uh, to question it concerning an issue or a problem. It's a self-discipline of mind that thoughtfully follows reason and evidence. Again, you got to collect evidence with an open mind in pursuit of the truth, the ability to change directions when that new evidence is presented. So if you find evidence that doesn't agree with the way you're going, don't just throw it away. Change the way you're going and accept that evidence as well. It's a set of skills that give a uh, appropriate consideration to the observable evidence. It allows for seasoned judgment and requires full appreciation of the problem. In other words, you're looking at the big picture. You're not focusing in right away and making this assumption and going with it. And it's also a mental process that faces problems with integrity, prioritizes issues, gathers and interprets evidence, is aware of assumptions, because assumptions can be dangerous. It draws conclusions based on that evidence interpretation. It exercises judgment and it tests the conclusions when appropriate. Now, here's an interesting case where not all the facts were taken into account, but a decision was made. So I was traveling into Topsom with a buddy of mine and we wanted to go get a water. So we drove to Starbucks and we paid like $3 for the water. Yeah, I go, hey, uh, why didn't you go to McDonald's? It's like right there. Oh, well, McDonald's would have too long a line. Starbucks would be quicker. Well, my buddy hadn't looked when we drove by because when I looked, there was nobody in line at McDonald's either. So that's where gathering evidence becomes important.
So to apply critical thinking, it's typically employed in decision making, problem solving, or judging real valuable, uh, or it's really valuable in everyday life. Uh, its skills are include objective observation, as we talked before, criteria used in deciding, self-correcting, focused questioning, um, establishing context, risk analysis, and use of theoretical constructs. It involves intellectual traits of the mind, such as fairness, integrity, and courage, uh, avoids the egocentric thinking of I, we believe, I want to believe, I have always believed, it is in my best interest to believe this. You know, this is where you get, well, this is the way we've always done it which I, I don't like that too much. And I really hate, well, if it ain't broke, don't fix it because you can always make something better. So I really hate that at work when someone throws that back into my face. Uh, uh, to apply, you also include a set of values such as questioning traditional institutions, customs, beliefs, processes, challenging authority, applying evidence and using the scientific method. So what is the scientific method of critical thinking? I think you could probably start almost anywhere on this circle. I kind of think maybe analyzing is where you would start. Start analyzing the problem, start looking for evidence, start reasoning about it, then you start evaluating that evidence that you gathered, then start problem solving. Maybe problem solving is where you start and that's when you actually you know, kind of define what the problem is. Uh, then you make your decision and you just keep moving around the circle. Maybe you move around this way, but that's using kind of a scientific method into critical thinking terms. Oh, how'd that get in there? All right. So a critical, a critical thinker uses questions as the basis for action, uh, understands the different norms and rules of different contexts and acts accordingly. So what that's saying right there is that, you know, you can come across the same thing and it can mean two different things depending on the situation you're in. So here's really a punctuation exercise but I like to use it to show context. So a panda walks into a bar, eats, shoots, and leaves. Okay, so how many people thought the panda went into the bar, had dinner and shot somebody and left? How many people think he went in and had some uh, some bean shoots and some leaves and for dinner. Okay. Maybe I was too fast with my slide here because I was trying to trick you into thinking that he went in and shot the place up and then had dinner. But we'll keep working on that one. We'll do this again sometime, I'm sure. So I've always wanted to try that. I mean, this is, I just added that this morning. Okay, a critical thinker tolerates ambiguity. Now this one I always had trouble with for the longest time until I finally talked to some people and then I figured it out. So I'm looking at it like an engineer and we don't like ambiguity. You know, you just, this is the way it is. This is how we're gonna do it. This is why we're doing it. But a critical thinker and even an engineer needs to uh, tolerate ambiguity because you don't wanna form your, um, hypothesis or solution before you have all the answers. You need to kind of keep it open while you're gathering evidence. So that's all that's saying. It tolerates ambiguity during the gathering of information stage to make sure you keep gathering. Because sometimes if you gather evidence that doesn't fit with your theory, it's very easy to let it drop assuming that oh, that evidence can't be right. That's, those facts aren't right. So. Keep an open mind is what this is basically saying. 
Uh, critical thinker tends towards alternative ways of thinking and acting without a crisis or a trauma forcing him or her to do so. This is like when I was talking about the cell phones. Another good example is uh, way, way back, if you're old enough to remember, when you wanted a watch, the watch to get was from Switzerland. It was a Swiss watch and it had a billion and five gears in it that made it work, but it worked really well. And the Swiss were on top of the watch market. Well, if they had kind of uh, kept track of the, uh, this alternative way of thinking and acting before there was a crisis, they might have started to switch around a little bit, but a new technology came into practice and that was using the vibration of a quartz crystal for your watch. And then all of a sudden, plastic watches with quartz crystals took off and the Swiss watch was no longer needed because it was too, too expensive. So that's when you need to know when to start switching before there's a crisis, because when there's a crisis, you're probably reacting and it's gonna be too late. Another thing a critical thinker does is challenges group think. And another thing that is kind of an old example but is very good is the uh, Challenger, the space shuttle. Because when that was being uh, designed and put together and they were coming down to the last minute, they found out that the O-rings didn't react very well to the cold and Florida had some cold enough temperatures that the O-rings could be actually affected. Well, the evidence wasn't super conclusive, but it was enough to kind of make doubt. Now, everybody was saying, let's launch. The president was saying, let's launch. Let's get people, let's get you know science teachers up there. Let's uh, get out there. So NASA was saying, let's launch. And the consultant was being paid by NASA was saying, let's launch. But the story is there was one engineer out of that group who was saying, no, no, the evidence isn't conclusive enough. We really shouldn't risk it. But after a while with groupthink, they worked on them and then everybody was unanimous and they launched the Challenger and the O-ring split causing the explosion. Um, so groupthink isn't always the best way to go. And another example is out of the movie, The Matrix, when the, one of the main characters says, well, a person is smart, but people are stupid. So now a critical thinker also questions the standard accepted or right solution to problems. In other words, that's letting go of old ideas to come up with a new idea. That's the way we've always done it, but they're thinking there's a better way to do it. Maybe that way wasn't wrong, but this way is better. And this is a pretty black and white example, but when COVID hit, my office was all paper. So we really couldn't go home and work. We had to stay right there and do the contracts that were paper. Well, someone grabbed that bull by the horns and they put everything onto uh, electronic so that within a two weeks, my whole office could actually go home and telework. We only had to come in uh, once in a while to handle the bids or uh, a paper contract, but for the most part, because we changed the way we did it, we can then go home and telework. Critical thinker does not blame other people. Doesn't matter who's at fault. Critical thinker is seeking information wherever they can get that information. Critical thinker creates accountability through self-discipline. In other words, they hold themselves accountable for getting things done and following through. A critical thinker will exploit the organizational strength. Perhaps they come up with a best practice manual, something like that. They recognize the organizational weaknesses. So perhaps they come up with a worst practice too. Not as often, uh, I don't see those as often as the best practice, but I have seen the uh, do not do this type of manual. On uh, no, a critical thinker also believes that the future is open and flexible rather than fixed and determined, because if you didn't think it was open and flexible, then why would you bother to even think? 
So critical thinking behavior, it raises important questions. That's how you're gonna get your evidence. You're gonna ask questions. You're gonna say, why, why, why? It raises the uh, important problems and it formulates them clearly and with precision. In other words, if getting the problem is half the issue, you know, formulating the question and the problem, once you've done that, you're halfway through to solving it. Critical thinker uh, gathers relevant information and interprets that information in a reasoned fashion. They drive toward well-reasoned conclusions and solutions. And a critical thinker thinks and proceeds with an open mind, recognizing that others may have different information and interpret information differently. And that's actually where cognitive bias, I guess, could help you because you look at things one way, share that information with other people because they look at it a different way due to their cognitive biases. And together, you're gonna to come up with a much better solution. So a critical thinker behavior also communicates effectively in order to increase the understanding of all parties, make sure everyone on your team is up to speed on what's going on, balances understanding other viewpoints with not being duly influenced by others. So it is kind of a balancing act where you take their information and you either you go with it or you kind of see that, oh, they're kind of influenced one way that is going to take, you know, take us the wrong way. So you need to weigh that information that comes in. Critical thinker will apply methods of logical inquiry and reasoning. So in short, critical thinking is the triumph of epistemology, which is the science of knowing, versus orthodoxy, which is adhering to accepted, established, or traditional ways. Any questions or comments? It's a lot of information that we rushed through there. Yeah, I, I do hope we get to look over those charts again. I didn't get my notes completed. <laughs> okay. What, uh, what we can do is I can send you these slides if you want to put your uh, email into uh, either send it to me in my email or in the chat. Or we can go over the slides again once we're all said and done too. No problem there. All right, now we're gonna get a little more fun. So we're gonna do a little exercise and it's a little tricky on the virtual side, but I think, I think it gets across the point we wanna do. So here's a case study with Tom W. And so what I'm gonna have you do here is read through this little blurb that's all about Tom W. And then I want you to rank uh, the following graduate school programs in order of likelihood that Tom W. is enrolled in it. So I only want you to do one. I don't want you to rank them all. Just which of these um, programs, and it's the business, it's the ones on the bottom, business administration, computer science, engineering, humanities, do you think Tom W. would be go into based on this study they did? And then I want you to tell me which one of these um, graduate school, you know, business administration, computer science, would have the most people in it? What is the most popular um, uh, classes to take? So is that is that all clear? Is that what I'm asking? So one. Which one do you think Tom W. enrolled in? And two, which one do you think is the most popular for people to take? What's the biggest school like? So you think most people are in law or do you think most people are in uh, business administration? What's the biggest college of study? And I'll give you a few minutes on that because I'm rambling on and I only got 15 more before Don will kick me off. So.
Don, do you have the um, optical illusions? You cover that, right? Yes, I have some optical illusions, yeah. which we can use if we want. I can skip over whichever slides. I've got way too many slides. So okay. wow. just kind of, I haven't been cutting them out. I've been adding and adding every time we do this. So it would take a day and a half to go through the whole thing, I suppose. Well, then this used to be an all day course, remember? Yes, yeah. So what we'll do then when after you're done, we'll throw up some optical illusions. If people think it's too late, they can jump off. And if they're, they want to stay on and watch them, they're, out, they're unbelievable. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I, I allude to those optical illusions right in the first slide that I've got. Perfect. I've added a couple of slides in to begin with to show kind of where we are. And we're very limited really in our skills. Yeah, we're very clever, but our brain processes all this stuff and we aren't as good as we thought we were. All right, give you another minute here on this one. Don't want to give you too long. You might see the little trick there, so. Everyone pretty much done or need another minute? All right, who wants to who wants to volunteer? Who's what is Tom W going into? I was thinking computer science. Okay. And just out of curiosity, uh, Dave, what did you pick as the um, most popular um, class or? Business administration. Business administration, excellent, excellent. Anybody else? Now you must've done something out there now, Come on, throw it out. Law. Law. And what was your, uh, what did you pick as the number one um, what am I trying to think? Uh, co courses of study. What do you mean by that? Oh, which one of the, like the business administration, computer science, do you think gets the most students every year? Social work. Social work. Okay, great. No, that's great. Okay, so. This, um, when I, I'll read this first paragraph and I'll, in, I'll show you what I was going for. Please read the following personality sketch for Tom W., a high school senior. It was written by the school psychologist who used several psychological tests of uncertain validity to draw these conclusions. Well, I told you to read this and I told you to tell me where you think he's going to go based on that. So the normal thing for people to do is to do exactly what you just did. So when you read uncertain validity, you ignored that. And you went on and thought, well, the psychologist is an expert. He knows what he's talking about. So I'm going to go with what he gives me. But once you, saw, once, once you see uncertain validity, you really can't go by anything that is in that paragraph. So what do you do? probability comes into play. So that's why I asked you to say, which of these and which of these courses here would be the most popular with people? Because all you can really guess is that Tom W is going to go with wherever the everybody else is going. That's the chance. That's the probability. You have nothing else to go on except everybody goes into business administration. That's that's the one I kind of think is the most popular. So I would have to assume that Tom W went into business administration because I don't have anything else to go on except we're guessing where most people go to. So he's going to go where most people go to. That's the probability chances. Does that make sense to everybody? It does, but I was under the impression you asked us to make a choice based on what we were reading there. Exactly, though. But and what that, you were reading. That's all we had. Yeah. No, but you always have probability. 
I wanted to make sure as much as possible that I was correct. And I got no intuitive bell ringing on anything that was presented there. And maybe that's why you've explained why I got no bell ringing. Yeah, very good. Yeah. So that that's just, and I learned this lesson, not that I didn't fall for this myself when I was taking the course, but I learned a lesson similar to this when I was in environmental engineering course, because the teacher gave us a problem with like 50 givens, 50 things of information. And we said, what are we supposed to do with all these? And he goes, well, sometimes in life, you're given more information than you need. So you have to go through and figure out which information you're going to actually use. And it's like, oh, I like that. Now I don't have to worry about using everything like I used to. So George. Yeah. Second paragraph that's there. Is that the findings of the psychologist or what Tom W is? That's the findings from those un, those uncertain validity tests. Okay. Those are the conclusions, yeah. All right. Now, speaking of... Uh, um, those... Uh, back here. Conspiracy theories. We are going to... I wanted to throw this in anyway. Because, you know, Da Vinci Code, that's a great book as well as a great movie. So conspiracy theories of the Da Vinci's, you know, Last Supper, where this is depicting Christ with his disciples. Or is it? So here's the controversy. So obviously the person on the right is Christ. And then we assume, from what we understand, the person on the left is, I believe, Peter or Paul, but in the Da Vinci Code, it says, boy, that, that Peter or Paul looks pretty feminine. And so they throw out the theory in the book that that's Mary. That's uh, not Mary, that's, uh, yeah, Mary Magdalene. So, and they also say, well, if you look at the way that Christ and that other disciple is sitting, well, that's the chalice, that's a symbol of the feminine. So mm -hmm. the controversy is, oh, well, that's obviously a woman sitting in there at the Last Supper. And what, that, what I wanted to demonstrate is this uh, scotomization. It's the psychological tendency in people to see what they want to see and not see what they don't want to see. And, you know, it's in situations, it's in themselves. It's even in a painting due to a psychological impact that seeing or not seeing would inflict. So I just wanted to throw that out to you guys to not, I'm not saying one way or the other what that picture is. I'm just saying that's how people will see things and this is why they're seeing it. All right, another case study. Um, this one is Linda. These are a little dated. I apologize for that. I mean, this one obviously look, reminds me of the 60s every time I read it. But uh, take a look at here. Imagine this woman named Linda, uh, she, you know, single, outspoken, very bright. Read down through here what it's about her. And then instead of ranking the following one through uh, eight or one through nine, however there are, there's eight of them, just tell me what you think is the most probable chance that fits Linda. And we'll take a few minutes there too. So instead of ranking them all, just tell me what's the most probable uh, fact that fits Linda. Linda's a psychiatric social, social worker. Uh, what was that again? Linda is a psychiatric social worker. Okay. Anyone else? Linda teaches elementary school. Okay. 
Oh, uh, one more person. One more. Well, I'm I'm more willing to say she probably has feminist leanings than I am to say that she's active in the feminist movement. Okay. Okay. Hey, great answers. You you uh you ruined my whole point. That's all. Because usually when I say pick one, first thing you think is, well, if we're going to only pick one, we got to make it count. So we better grab one that has all kinds of information in it because that chances are I'll be right that way. So a <laughs> lot of people actually will say, Linda is a bank teller and is active in the feminist movement. And now why would that be wrong? You guys all picked a different one than that, but that's usually the one that people say. Is there any reason why you think that's probably not the probable, the most probable answer? Because two things have to be right for that one to be right. So the chances of two things being right is a lot harder than one thing. So each of you picking like psycho, uh, psychiatric social worker, or active in the feminist movement or teaches elementary school, they have a much more probable chance of being correct than her working as a bank teller and being active in the feminist movement. If it said, or, then it would be a lot better to pick the two choices. Because if it's either this or that, your chances are twice as good that you're right. But uh, this is really just a exercise in probability. Because when it comes down to a lot of things, probability is the best way to go. Um, there's another book, and I don't think I had it up here, and I don't know why, but it's called The Drunkard's Walk. And that's another really good critical thinking book because it talks about all the things that are random. A lot of things we think are really easy to predict because they're straightforward, the stock market, how a basketball team's going to do, how a coach is, but they're all really random. And once you understand that, then you have to use probability and statistics, and you're going to be a lot closer to the answer. So with that being said, when in doubt, what are the odds? And what are the odds is alluding to probability. And we're almost on one hour here. So I'll just real quickly here say, you know, everyone knows this. If you're going to to toss a coin, what are the odds you're going to get heads? 50%, right? It's 50 50. There's only two chances, two choices. It's going to be one or the other. Now, if you uh, have two children, you know, what are the odds that one is a boy? What are the odds that both are boys? Well, now it's getting a little more tricky because if I were to say, if you have one child, what are the odds one's a boy? Well, again, it's 50-50. But when you start throwing in two children, now the possibilities are girl, boy, boy, girl, because that's different, boy, boy, and girl, girl. So the chances that you have one boy with two children is not 50-50, it's 75%. And the chances that you have two boys is only 25%. Jeffrey Turnbull has raised his hand. Thank you for putting that up like that. I, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Do you take quantum physics uh, principles awareness into consideration when you're making odds? Um, no, I don't. I don't even understand them, so. Um, <laughs> I might state it briefly. I think it points out that the consciousness and expectations of the observer influence the outcome. Mm -hmm. Okay. Say that again, Jeff, I'm sorry. The um, conscious expectations of the observer influence the outcomes of the experiment. Okay, sure, that makes sense. I see what you're saying. 
Yeah, I don't I don't think this would affect this one too much, but I can see where that would certainly affect other things quite often. You have to be careful uh, how you're looking at it. Well, I, I saw that it affects when you're tossing a coin and that it affects whether or not you'll have a boy or a girl born. Okay, I was looking at the two things as separate. One interesting point in that probability is that the probability that both children will be of the same sex is 50-50. For one child, yeah. For, for two child, that you have the boy boy or the girl girl are, as a case of. Oh, I see what you're saying, yeah. Both being the same. Um, one interesting thing in critical thinking, I spent 16 years commuting from Orno to Castine. Mm -hmm. And on the way, it was amazing number of times I had to make it, they could take different routes. They were all the same length and took about the same time. So one is to recognize that it didn't matter. And that, but if I didn't make a choice, I wouldn't get there. Yeah, there you go, yeah. And so minor prejudice uh, influenced me over time to take, take a different route. That's, uh, that's like me driving from uh, Waterville to Augusta every day. Talk yep. about habits. Sometimes I get to Augusta and I say, when did I pass Sydney? And it, it's kind of scary. I assume if something happened out of the ordinary, it would bring me out of my habitual thought and I would react to it. But sometimes I don't remember passing the Sydney exit. So, <laughs> Yeah, I can relate to that. <laughs> All right, so this, this kind of explains too why uh, two options are always harder than one option because if you have one kid, it's 50%. If you have two, it's now 0.5 times 0.5 or 0.25. That's the equation of it. I, it's a lot easier to write down all your possibilities as long as it's not too big of a, a subset. But I'm not gonna keep going into uh, more with the probabilities because I think you guys are getting the whole thing right there. So I am gonna uh, just end it, my section here with this Dilbert cartoon because all engineers love Dilbert. So his boss comes down to the engineering department and says, the second option feels right, let's go with that. And Dilbert goes, should we always ignore what the data says or is this more like a one-time thing? And then the, the boss comes out with type one thinking and says, it's called intuition. And then, of course, Dilbert has to reply that it's a slippery slope to witchcraft. And it, it's kind of a good point because a lot of people think if you do go with your gut feeling, you're going to be right. But chances are, if you go with your gut feeling, you're going to be wrong. And unfortunately, that even goes with experts. So they have little mechanisms they have to go through to make sure they don't just throw out the wrong answer. So. But with that, I'm gonna I'm close out my side here. Uh, why don't we take a few minute break? That about intuition? Yeah. Um, when I use the word intuition, my understanding is that it's a subtle, it's like putting a program into a computer. It's like a subtle feedback based upon a lot of information that's held subconsciously and unconsciously and the subconscious works it all out and, and can do that for us way and we can get answers from that i gotcha yeah yeah okay what do you think shall we start now sounds good okay well i, I just saw that i found this yesterday and i was thinking about how we, we cannot depend upon our own senses to take in accurate information and so early people biblical times this is what people could see. They knew they walked on some earth. They knew if they walked most in any direction, they were surrounded by oceans. They could see this dome over the head. 
that rotated over them daily. And that was, they called that the firmament and uh, had the stars and so forth, fixed stars and everything like that. And it was blue. So the only explanation they had for why that would be blue would be the, there had to be an ocean on the other side of it. So this was there. And then outside of that ocean, of course, then was Helen and so forth. And that, that, was, that thought was contained in, within civilization up until this is the Fomerian engraving, which was published in 1888. And it was more or less the same sort of thing. Uh, and there were in the Middle Ages, people claimed to have walked to the edge of the earth, you know, to the ocean, and looked under that firmament, and they could see heaven on the other side of it. We can always trust the experts to tell us what's true. And so then men, you know, we started developing lenses in the 1600s, and then later, since recently, we've got the computers. And so we've had this to, <coughs> to uh, change our perception of the universe that surrounds us. We've got these beautiful photos from the Hubble telescope of our own galaxy. And then we look further and we'll find, whoa, we were surrounded by these galaxies. So as of course in our ritual too, it says that, that uh, you know, fund of science and industry is implanted in us. And we have, we've gone a long way from this, that idea right there for where we are in the cosmos to coming up in our uh, April, Arts and Celebration, the Arts and Sciences, the uh, astronomy. Anyway, so critical thinking, what we're trying to do now, we have, our brains are not just a single organ. And the, it's not hardwired to the, go through the tasks that we in our modern civilizations come through. And apparently they, you, we can train people in critical thinking because of the Washington Post article, where participants were trained in several fields and then tested them five years later. And they still showed that the test group these, uh, did better than the control group. Now, what we're trying to do in critical thinking is to get this brain that we've got that is not just one lump. And is you can see just a few of the parts here shown. And then there are left and right hemispheres. And this thing is not hardwired together. It, uh, it does not, we have to train it to work with our, and that's something where in our early childhood years, a lot of development training of connecting these various parts of the brain. And that's one thing that worries me about having children look in front of, look at a screen for a lot of their input, you know, babysit with a, some sort of a, either a, a phone or a TV or that sort of stuff, because we're limiting kind of what sensory input can, can come in to there so they can, actually develop parts to connect to all these things and get this thing to work as one unit. And uh, to keep to keep these two left and right hemispheres together or get them to work together, we have the cerebral cortex, which is a thin, thin layer, uh, whoops, going the wrong direction, a thin layer up over here, which connects the left and right hemispheres and transfers the information both ways. And then our cerebral cor cortex, that's the cerebral cortex. Six layers of nerve cells, pathways connected all together. And that's, that's responsible for our thought, perception, memory, motor functions, social abilities, language, and so forth. This connects the entire brain together, hooks it up. Now the corpus callosum, that has to uh, tie our left and our right eye together. I see our left. Left eye is controllable, right eye is controllable, left side of the brain. Touch, this also has to get touch work. My left hand is controlled by my right side of my brain, my right hand is controlled by the left. And so therefore I've got to have, when I'm working with something, I've got to have be able to, my brain has to meld these two, two uh, sig signals coming in from my left and right, my left and right eyes, and make one out of it. And so that, that's all handled here to get this so that the brain does actually handle the two sides of my body, or the, or the thoughts and the feelings and so forth, nerves are connected. And then now we say, oh, well, okay. We, we notice this is very common. Teenagers take more risks than adults do. 
Okay, so recently, and since 2010, we've had a lot of brain research has been going on, and we find it is, that is true. In general, the male teenagers engage in more risky behaviors. They overestimate the benefits of something, and they underestimate the risk involved in it. And this is something we just have to see them through and get them through that part. So what happens when we make a memory or when, our do, we do, when we do something? Inside our brains, a neuron has to reach out and connect with something from some other part of the brain. So we form all these electrochemical uh, connections within our brain. And this is part of our, our so-called learning. And then of course, within Alzheimer's, those, those neurons and so forth start breaking down. So anyway, uh, go, as far as our learning goes, of course, we've got the, whoops, went too far. Learning involves all of these various areas of the brain, different parts handled by different parts. Of it. And then inside the brain is our, our primitive part of our brain, our, our uh, reptilian side, which is a little more emotional and so forth. Anyway, if we start learning, what we remember about 10% of what we read, about 20% of what we hear. So if all somebody reads to us, we're gonna remember 10% of that. If we, we, if we read that, if we hear them say it, we're gonna remember about 20% of it. And we remember about 30% of what we see. So if we, if we read something, someone tells us that, and then there's some sort of naughty visual aid, we get, we get up here, we get up to 50% we can remember. And then down here, and this is what comes in with our Masonic ritual. What we do, we can remember. So therefore, if we take an acting part of my ritual, learn the, the charges, learn the degree work and so forth, then we remember 90% of it. If we don't, if we just listen to others do it, we're back here, we don't remember much of it. And as far as writing something down, we remember 70% of it. So if we're gonna learn something, we've got to read it. We need to hear it, see it. We've got to also say it, we've got to do it and we've got to write it and so forth. So this is, if we wish to learn something, this is just kind of the hierarchy. And the thing is scary, our working memory, most of us have got less than 10 items in our working memory. Seven or eight items for most of us is about what we can handle in our working memory. So if I'm gonna cut a board and do something with it, I could go, oh yes, I measure it all out. Oh, 57 three eighths, 57 three eighths. I go down to cut it and I measure it out 53 and seven eighths. My memory didn't work. And that's quite a very common er error for us to make. Uh, and I think I've got some, okay, here we go. Attention and working memories. If we could, all of us, if we quickly count the Fs in this sentence very quickly. Everybody can do it orally, you can just do it, uh, shout out a number or something at the end and so forth, if you would, please. Okay. Now, one thing we often, when we're going through here, that capital F is gonna take, break our attention away from this F on the end of of. If our letter begins and ends in a letter, a word, excuse me, we recognize it, see it quicker. And so we have one F there, two, three, four, five, six Fs in that first line, seven, eight, and nine. So most of us, if we quickly tried to count those, at least I wouldn't, I would probably miss that one. Uh, we get uh, around seven or eight Fs, my best math for that. And then another one. Here we go. Say the months, now the months of the year, there are only 12 of them. However, for us to say those in alphabetical order, we've got to mem remember more things than that, more than the 12 months, more than uh, how, which letter they start with or something. We've got to remember their spelling. So, very quickly, what do you get for the first month of the year, alphabetically? 
April. And, okay, good. Usually we wind up with uh, August for some reason. Yes, April is the first month. And then August will be the second. The third month? February? How about December? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, okay. It's, it's, this is, and, and again, this isn't, this isn't some wonderful thing that somebody's developed. This limits, this shows how the limits of that working memory we have. So, so yes, we go, we go December, then we get February. And then what have we got a bunch of them there? We got a bunch of J's and M's and and so forth. So is J our next, next set to go to? So should we go to January, July, June? Is that the right way? Okay, J, J. Uh, and then what have we got? March. Oh, yeah. And then we got October, November. Are those the last two? November, March, November, October. Is that it? Anyway, that's just a show. And it's kind of fun to do this, do this as a in a group. To have people, you know, just quickly shout out these names, and there's another one that that one for me that some of our birth date, you know, my birth date's eight eighteen forty one. Well, that's easy for me to say, but I can't add that all up very easily. And yet I can add one thousand nine hundred and forty one along with eighteen, along with eight, but again, it's more difficult. Another thing five. we have we can't do. Excuse me, question. Um, I said, we have this visual perception. When things are not straight lined up for, we have to turn them around. Our brain has to turn them around. And so are these numbers, is this the correct way of, is that four correct? Is that five correct? Is that seven correct? When we turn that, flip that seven around, is that correct? That four is backwards, right? That seven is correct. That five is reverse, right? That two is gonna be okay. That five is, somewhere that, that five looks good to me. This five does not, looks funny. I can see that five. And then that seven is backwards. So the answers there are normal reverse, reverse, normal, normal, reverse, normal, reverse, reverse. So, normal reverse reversed. So this is, again, when we're doing our critical thinking, what are we looking at? Our brain is trying to make in, in, make something make sense of what's in front of us here. And we've got two eyes being handled by two different sides of our brain to say, uh, I recognize the number four there, but it's not right side up. Okay, so another way of working and developing some of our critical thinking abilities are riddles, and you can do this with you. And this apparently works. Apparently the data shows that this does work if we tra train this. With these simple little brain teasers, riddles, and that sort of stuff, we can actually improve ourselves, our critical thinking abilities. Riddles are not one that I don't necessarily do very well. Okay, what runs but never walks, mouth but never talks, head but never sweeps, bed but never sleeps? Anybody get a thought of that right quickly? River? Yeah. That, I know I wouldn't catch that from this, but the hint, then also, oh yeah, okay, now I see that. So, and then we have these things like numbers. A woman gave natural birth to two sons, born about the same hour, same day, same month, same year, but they were not twins. And many times we get hung up on how could they not be twins? Could be what? Triplets, quadruplets, or something. So again, uh, leading us, the words leading us in one direction, then we have to make a decision some other way. Here's one. We adults tend not to do this well. Uh, first and second graders do this very well. Which way is this bus headed? Anybody? Anybody got a thought? Good old left. Yes, the bus is headed left. Now the first and second graders, because they ride these things, the 
exit door is on the right. There's no exit door here. Therefore, we must be looking at the left side of the bus. Therefore, the bus may, must be facing left. And so therefore, our critical thinking skills as adults aren't necessarily as good as those five and six-year-olds who are connected with this daily. And then you've got these the, the various tests to um, try to show what, how our brain functions under these. And what we've got to do here, the Stroop test asks you not to say the name of the word, but the color of the word. And because the primary uh, reading is almost an automatic, the, that red comes out immediately to say. So I go here, that color is red, that color is white, that color is green, that's brown. That's green, that's red, that's brown, that's white. That's not white, that's red. And so just go ahead through trying to say these fast. So I am slowly is, isn't too bad, but we, it takes us longer to process the color of these letters, our brain longer to, color, to process the color that these letters are written in than it does to process the word that is out there. So we go red, white, gr yeah, green and brown and white, green, brown, red, <coughs> brown, red, green, white, and so forth. And then a little bit of explanation of that Stroop test. Now, I'm not sure what people use this for, psychiatrists, psychologists, and so forth. Anyway, this measures that delay in our reaction time when we have an automatic reading of a word and then the saying of the color of the letters. We can read the word faster, and that interferes with our ability to name the color of the word. I still don't know what that has to, to do with actually what, what they can determine from that about our brain function <coughs> and our emotions. This one. Um, you can determine how then, literate you are. You're not literate. You have a problem with it. I didn't hear that. Um, that Stroop test could determine how literate you are because, because if you're not literate, you won't have a problem stating the colors of those. Oh, right. That's, that could be, yes. Yeah. yeah. For most of us, that's an automatic thing to, look, to see the word first and have to think about the colors. So that could be a reasonable explanation, I think. And here's one where our perceptions, based on the shadow of this, this column here, uh, if we go there, is A, are A and B the same color? Okay, now I go to the next slide and I'll put a line between A and B and they are the same color. So this, this shadow from this green column in here, this affects our brain's ability to perceive what's, which one is the darker, like that, which one is the darker and the lighter color. I still can't, I can't make those two colors be the same shade, but yet I go down to the next slide and they're the same shade. So, uh, and then here, <clears throat> this tests our peripheral vision. On this diagram, we've got 12 dots. And I can see, at the most, I can see two dots at a time. If I look here, I can see a dot there and a there, and one there. If I look here, I can see two dots there. If I look here, I can see a dot here and here. And yet when I see this whole thing, I can't see all those 12 dots on that. They're there, but I don't, I cannot see them. You know, my, my brain says, no, okay, that's just the same. And it blends all the rest of these in together. So our brains pro do a lot of work processing the two sides, the two images that are coming into it from the left and the right side. <coughs> Here's another one. And this, I can see a pale blue, pale blue uh, circle in there, white light blue circle. And yet, if I put my hands up in front of the screen and block out some of the lines, all of a sudden that uh, I can make this white and that white look alike if I block these two, these lines with my hands. Again, this shows the, we cannot depend on what we see. Just like when we look down the railroad tracks, 
we see them come together down there somewhere and we know full well they don't yet our brain processes them that way and we can't stop our brain from doing that that's an automatic process and these here we go these if you stare at these things in the middle they start those wheels start crawling and yet they're not those are just solid you know just images that's on a slide and here's another one chase that around and all of a sudden that instead of that being a blue that starts being a green and that of course that's a, there's a physical reason for that we're having that uh, within our eyes that color fatigue with the chemically we're using up the chemicals to process the colors properly and now you start seeing a green thing go around after images and now this one is hard if you if you stare right at the dot in the center here and and stare at that for more than 30 seconds all the other stuff starts fading out i look at that and the cat's ears start disappearing for me and then i don't see the really well, at least i see a cat there maybe and so by staring at that spot our brain starts blocking out those unchanging images so shades and starts looking at that x and those teeth maybe so and these are fun little things for we we have them on and, uh, online everywhere. Here's another one. I for life of me, I cannot see these as the same color circles in behind here. This is and oh yes, yeah, right. There are names. I'm not sure there's a name for. I'm not for the name for that one. Our neurons stop responding to understanding stimuli for that thing. But this is so-called Munker illusion. Now I have no idea who or what, who Munker was or what that is supposed to tell us about our thought process, other than we cannot absolutely depend on our eyes. These things change. And he, looking at this one, this appears not parallel. They, and yet when we, if we blur those images, they come out parallel. Let me, uh, see if I can back this out and not. okay if we look over here see see how these look this blurred image looks parallel and that was not doesn't do quite so bad it looks more parallel than when we actually clicked on it that really to me this one looks more much more parallel than that one when I make a big image okay now I've got to try to get back from the slide from the current slide there we go uh blurred but parallel when it's blurred and here's another one common these two tables perspective how our minds our eyes uh process the information coming in if we take uh, these are except for the distortion of the of the uh image by putting it on here and stretching it out they um take this distance here and compare it to that distance they don't look alike yet if we have some kind of a pencil or something we can put across that we put a pencil across from here to here and then put it over here or here we get pretty close to the same distance you can put something up there and similarly the other way that looks this looks much longer to me than this does and i and you know many some of these optical illusions we can uh uh, stare at it long enough, finally, we can get our brain to straighten it out and see what we're looking at. But this one, I cannot make that change. And again, we our brains try to complete the image. They don't like to leave spots. So within this image, all we've got, we've got uh, th three little teepees and three Pac-Man here. And yet our brains, or mine does anyway, puts in a white triangle in the middle here, connecting them all. And again, that's automatic, and we're, um, we're born that way, and we've got to, through critical thinking work, we've got to train ourselves not to see that in there. And we can, uh, I think we can show that by, if we go ahead and we bought some part of an image here, then all of a sudden the, that, that part of the white line disappears. You can make it show up by blocking part of them. And that was, uh, some guy, a psychologist, Italian psychologist. And again, I'm not sure what that tells us. Anybody got any wild idea what what that tells us about our thought processes? Our, our 
you know, emotional psychology or anything. I, yes, Jeffrey, got a thought? <laughs> Just, I can't trust my eyes. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, our eyes are fine. They take in just billions of, of bits of information, and our brain has to sort that all out and make some sort of pattern out of it for us to be able to comprehend. But uh, Yeah, I think that's exactly what it's telling us, Don, that yeah. you're going to fill in the blanks, so that's what you got to be careful of. Yes, right, and, and I, I think that'll come up here with the blind spot. That'll show up too. Okay, so anyway, we got a psychologist, got a name, and it sounds very impressive. Kinesia, Kinesia effect. Okay. Oh, here's the blind spot, and this one's quite hard to do on screen. You can get, well, for me, I can move over here somewhere about a foot in front of that X, and that yellow circle disappears. For me and this is a problem with driving that blind spot by the time we get out there with cars and so forth that blind spot is pretty big and that can easily that blind spot can easily take in a say a motorcycle or a bicycle or, or a jogger or something we we look and we don't see there's nothing there and yet there really is so that's why <clears throat> it's <clears throat> we're we're cautioned to look twice look twice before you cross Okay, if there's something moving like a train you're going to cross and you, if the train is in your blind, blind spot the first time you look, if you look again, that train is moving, it's no longer in your blind spot. So that's why that uh, warning or caution or admonition, look twice before you do something on, with this moving. Uh, I had an example of that one, one morning. I was driving out, I was on a gravel road here, and I was driving out and I could see my neighbor uh, I was a couple of miles from the house. I could see my neighbor backing out of his driveway, but I could not see his face. I, and I tried slowing down, whatever. And I finally realized there's no way, if I couldn't see his face, there was no way he was going to be able to see me probably. So I just stopped and waited and let him back out on the road in front of me. <laughs> of course, it jumped him for me to show up there all of a sudden. But we, in driving, these are some of the problems we have to worry about. These, these things, our brain is interpreting what we're looking at. And so the first, the first thought when we look at this, uh, I tend to see a man hugging a woman sitting down as opposed to a man sitting down and a woman hugging him. And they make, they make wonderful things to put in, you know, side bits and, and little images in newspapers and so forth. And then now another thing we can do to work ourselves to help our critical thinking is to do riddles, math riddles. We can do math, you know, two and two is, uh, two plus two is four, also two times two is four. And I'll find a set of three different whole numbers whose sum again is equal to the total when multiplied. And of course, this has got to be small numbers because either if we go up when we multiply and they, they become entirely different. So. One, two, and three also work. And then we get stuff like this, logic in there. Uh, how many animals the farmer has? I only have, I only ever keep sheep, goats, and horses. At the moment, they were all sheep except for three. Okay, so what this tells us is there are three goats and horses. And all of them are goats except four. So there are four sheep and horses. And horses except five so therefore there must be five sheep and goats and therefore we have to then conclude there must be one horse you know and whatever we can subtract those um, these are good ones where we say i'm three times as old as my brother and so forth that sort of thing and then again here here's one that's very easy to make a mistake on if i put the, if i took the 25 off there i can see that 471 is not less than 147 but yet when i look at that i've got all the same digits in there and i i really can't necessarily see the difference between that this is a larger number than that number and then uh, of course these we have all these sorts of brain teasers riddled everything for children right straight through so 
this is something which we entire life could practice working on that critical thinking. And for those who like to do riddles or do these sorts of things, I like to do those uh, logic riddles like this one. This is a very common one. Uh, Joe's father has three sons. He's got Peter, Nick, and what's the other guy? You know? Well, we live out Joe. I've seen this done with uh, Mary's mother has two girls, that sort of thing. What's the other sister? And then these, these sequences, we get, you know, our logic again, two to four, 12 to 14 is two, to 18 is four, to 24 is six, to 32 is eight. And then we go to two, just so it shows two, all right, so for the next sum on this, you could two, four, should be then 36. We keep taking this is this, this is our sequence, and we start the sequence over between 32 and 34. So these things, if you like to do them, apparently, the, the data show, the research shows that these do actually improve our critical thinking skills. And then we got a whole, oh yeah, there's the goats and horses and so forth. Now, there are many critical thinking fallacies we run into. The first one, and, and we see this especially on Facebook and, and our social media. The first thing is the argument against the person. That doesn't mean his argument is right or wrong. It's just you don't like that, but you don't like the person who argues for it. Or ignorance. If there isn't any evidence against it, well, it must be true then. Pity, that's a very common one. Uh, popular, everybody thinks this, therefore. Uh, this, the begging question, this, this was an example. Was that your father, George, that uh, did this? Begging the question, if the King James Version was good enough for Jesus Christ, is good enough for me? I know your father's told that many times. <laughs> King James Version being written when? Uh, 15, 1600s, <laughs> Christ was, was, had been dead for 1500 years. So I think it was my grandfather, but I think dad's on here. Maybe he clear that up for. Yes, he had been. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, and then many times, of course, these are for jokes. Are you still as self centered as you used to be? Have you stopped, you know, beating on little children or something like that? that and uh, and he had equivocation, where we changed the word. You say, I said I'd not speak to my neighbor again. Well, I didn't. I sent him a text message, that sort of thing. We, that isn't quite what I said, but I implied with you that I would never communicate with that neighbor again, but I did. And then um, the false, these are, of course, these are used all the time within our, especially, of course, uh, your advertisers use these in the critical thinking errors. Um, of course, politicians do all the time. Uh, in debates, we use these. And then this is stuff, uh, George, you were alluding to. If we've had six uh, heads in a row, we think, well, the next one's got to be a tail because they know it's 50-50, but yet the, the odds of the next one is still 50-50. And then you go, well, his, you can't, you couldn't trust his mother anyway, you know, his mother was, you know, blah, blah, blah. So uh, anyway, um, th this is something we see not, does not follow. Okay. And this, so, uh, you, you have a statement like people like to walk in the gardens. Okay, so the extension of that gardens have dirt, therefore dirt floors and houses would be a good idea. And this is something we see quite often in our critical thinking errors. And this is one that's used all the time, this post-hoc. After this, therefore because of this, a uh, lot of like, for instance, if anybody mentioned if, if some ball game was going in the no hitter was underway, if anybody mentioned that, they, they say, hey, you jinked it, you caused him, you know, and then if, if he didn't come out and be a, a no-hitter for the rest of it. And we do, and we have these, um, we wear a, a red tie or something at these occasions because something good happened. 
uh, our neighbor, uh, when I was growing up here, one of our neighbors, Aunt Kate, she wasn't aunt, but she was Mrs. Ford, but she did not want to be called Mrs. Ford because it made her feel old. So all we children in the neighborhood had to call her Aunt Kate. Anyway, she absolutely hated bright, sunshiny days during the winter. She said, nothing but a weather breeder. Well, after good days, we have storms. And she thought, therefore, that good day caused the storm. And then we hear this about the red herring. Their uh, fox dogs, they would uh, have a young dog between it. And so they'd drag a red, a red herring was the uh, smoked herring, very, very odiferous. And they would drag it across the trail and see if it could pull the dog off the actual argument. Okay, I must, oh yeah, we have this straw man. You, you attack somebody based on some position that they don't, they don't really have. Anyway, and all that, I saw a slippery slope somewhere that George. Okay, um, I think I've gone, huh? All right, I've gone down through. I've, maybe I've got the shortened version. I, that's what I've got, I bet you. I don't know. Anyway, card tricks, another thing that uh, uh, magicians do. And I'll try doing one here. If I, I'm going to have to have some input from somebody. Okay, what the magician does is say, okay, would you name two suits? So somebody name two suits, please. Two cards, you know. Hearts and diamonds. Okay, hearts and diamonds. Okay, that leaves spades and clubs. Okay, would somebody or you, spades and clubs, name one of those. Somebody name one of those, so spades and clubs. Club, club. Okay, uh, would you name all the odd clubs? One of clubs, three of clubs, five of clubs, seven of clubs, nine of clubs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, and uh, then one is the ace, so we got a three, five, seven, and nine. <clears throat> okay, would you name two of those? Ace of clubs. Yeah, go ahead, name them. Which Seven one? and nine. Seven and nine. Okay, name one of those. Nine. Okay, that leaves seven, right? So seven of the clubs is what we're left with. Okay. <laughs> See, <laughs> and so, um, uh, and this, of course, don't ever do this twice with anybody because then you'll see it because you start here if they know what you what you're doing i say okay name two suits so just name two suits whatever, whichever ones you want you can name if you like or not name it if you name clubs and, and hearts say i'll say okay if you name diamonds and spades i'll say okay that leaves and so essentially i've forced that card on and this is what magicians use they bypass some of our critical thinking skills. Okay, um, this is the, uh, the that napkin shaped thing over the top of our head that hooks all of our brain together, and uh, it and this this transmits all these messages between the right and left hemispheres of our brain. Okay, whoops. So I, I went over that once. Uh, and then we've got these sorts of things. Your mother, sister, married an only child. It was kind of fun to do. Who is your mother's only sister's brother's aunt's daughter's sister's father? You know, it's just something. That, okay, your mother's only sister's sons. Okay, your mother's nephew. His brother's aunt. Well, that would be your mother again, wouldn't it? And your aunt's daughter's sister's father is your father. But these are these will I don't I have it's fun to do to do these sometimes. And then now here's one that's uh, a perception to see and visualize triangles. And this supposedly is purported to be used in China as a mem measure of of our intelligence. And you have to think, I think you have to be able to find at least 
18 triangles to be considered normal uh, IQ. And so you'll see we've got all kinds of, we've got a triangle here, and then we've got a triangle here, this one and four, and we've got a triangle here, this one, four, and seven. And then we've got a triangle here of six, and then we've got six and five, and then we've got four, five, and six, and another triangle. So what we do is go through this and try to count up how many triangles there are all together. Many times when we do this, we don't get the outside triangle. We see this sometimes with squares, count the squares, count that sort of thing. Now, I, whether this really is used in China as a measure of your intelligence, it'd be a down dirty, a quick one, you know. And then we have here math. Again, this will be treating it. Okay. Um, number in this sequence. Uh, I did that one, didn't I? Okay. That was, oh, here we go. This is uh, our spatial manipulation. Can we move three, three of these X's? and flip the triangle upside down. I think the last time we did it, we had somebody who could see that very quickly. Can anybody see how we can move just three of these X's and make it an upside down triangle? Yeah. Yeah, which, which one does he move? The lower left and lower right. Okay, up to here, I take it. Yeah. yeah. And then you move that one down. So you wind up with four here, three here, two, and then one. Yeah. And this, again, I'm not sure what this is supposed to show about a devil, a intelligence or, a, or a, uh, critical thinking skills, but they are, our brain has to do this. And it takes this image in, a left and a right image. It has to be processed in those two images, put together, processed by our, grain, by our brain, and then decisions made from that. It's a lengthy process. And the riddles like for children, which animals can jump higher than a house? Well, a house can't jump, so therefore any can. Before Mount Everest was discovered, what was the highest mountain on earth? Well, if Mount Everest is the highest, then it was still high, even before we discovered it. But yet it looks like it was what was uh, considered to be misreading what being said there. Oh yeah, this is, this is one of these. Um, some guy had 17 horses to give away and left half of them. So we try half of 17, doesn't work out. You see, that's eight and a half. So the neighbor came along, gave him one more horse. So he gave him 18 horses. And then half of them went to one guy, nine of them. Uh, third of them, six of them went to another guy. That's 16. One ninth of them, two of them went to the youngest son. So that all adds up to 17. And then there's that one horse left over the neighbor could take back home. Uh, now, um, this is, and of course, there's an awful lot of work going on in the brain. And uh, curiosity, if we're curious about something, we are, we, of course, we remember, we learn it quicker anyway. Another thing is starting where I just saw this week a, where, hypersonic uh, signals can uh, Im impact our brain. So, you know, these frequency sounds. And I think, uh, didn't we have a chance with China? In China, they were doing something like that. And people were having headaches and so forth, and they were thinking this is what they were doing, sending in some sort of sounds. Okay, and then process like this and so forth. So, and then we get these these visual things. You know, you see some people looking at the ocean. Or do you see a baby in this? And again, that's uh, I'm not sure what that measures, whether it's good or bad. Our brain can make two different patterns out of that. And then some of these things. I see spirals and so forth. I cannot make that show up. And here's another thing for children playing these mazes, these word mazes. And uh, whoops, I, so they're supposed to chase it. Apparently I didn't get the whole thing in the, uh, let me escape. Okay, there we go. There's a better view of it, I guess. And uh, 
you see the child has to take this through to the end of the thing down here somewhere. And again, good, good learning as, as it were. Okay, if I can get back. Okay. And then number patterns, you got to put the right number in here. Again, these are good. A lot of these are, are there's a lot of stuff aimed at children. So if we have young, younger, youngsters to work with, they can develop, we can develop critical thinking skills and improve their critical thinking skills by doing fun little games with them. And then we got 31, 43, 47, 53, next number. So that was what, 10? And then we got two, four, six. I'm guessing that's gonna be eight. So we're gonna be 61 maybe, I don't know. Oh yeah, okay, here we are. And then we have things to check our stress levels and so forth. And uh, we, we've got a, a deer, and if you see more, it's actually it's two dolphins uh, diving. And if you don't see, if you see more than one or two differences, you may want to, you know, need to take some time off. And so what we're supposed to, what this picture is, two dolphins. And so if we see more than two dolphins jumping, and this was used apparently in St. Mary something. And you look at these two dolphins jumping out of the water. The dolphins are essentially identical. Closely monitored study showed that in spite of the fact that dolphins are so similar, if we are under stress, we find more differences between these. And the more differences we find, the more stress we experience. So this apparently was, a, this has been reported as a definite uh, study that was taken at a particular hospital. So here we go, we'll look at it. So this is something that we see a lot. We hear about these studies that were done. I mean, of course, yeah, we have two dolphins, we get a dolphin and a steer jumping. But yet we often hear this as far as on the news or in social media, oh, a study was done, you know, well, yeah, phooey. That wasn't how many was, were in the group, one, you know? And then, so, uh, yeah, okay, that ends, that's that's the end of it, George, I guess. Whoops. Good place for it right there. Good ending point, Don. Yeah.